much if your life experiences have been every time I push, nothing ever happens, uh, then you're not that likely to, to get involved in transition at that early stage. So certainly what, you know, where we are, there are older people who are involved and they bring those skills uh, and, it's, and it's fantastic. Um, maybe they've just got a very, very nice box that they live in that they're very, very pleased with. You know. <laughs> <laughs> when there was more local food culture and bringing that stuff back in. In Cornwall there's been some really interesting work working with Age Concern and local schools and bringing the kids together with people from Age Concern to hear those stories. Um, but again, I think it's, it's very much like, like I said, every, every transition initiative is very, very different. Even if, it's, even if there's nine of them in Camden, every one of those within Camden has a very different feel and culture and identity to it. Perhaps you should uh, recruit um, a retired person on your core group. We have two or three retired people on our actual transition, yes, <laughs> including me. Um, and it does make a difference because obviously, yeah, we, as Rob says, we have got time, some time. To, uh, to help out, do extra things that obviously those who are you know, in full-time employment haven't got time to do. Um, so maybe that's, you know, maybe that's it. Then you can lure a few other retirees into the, into the fold. I don't know. Just a suggestion. <laughs> There's a great project in Ireland, actually, which is a big social enterprise there run by a woman called Mary Nally, which is working with, with people who are retired and getting them, and they, they run an advice line like, like uh, for, 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 older, uh, for other older people about their rights and benefits and this, that and the other, and often like a sort of Samaritans for older people, you know. Just in response to this issue of older people uh, and, and establishment I'm the only one from Transition Chelmsford, and we, our group was actually sparked by um, the RSA um, working with Chelmsford on a, tra a changing Chelmsford plan and, and realising the vision we all talked about transitioning. And, um, and in that context, it was the fact that they have such a respected voice that means that we're presenting to the civic society and also that the people who set up the, the co-op, uh, like the co-op bank, and, and we've actually got a lot of elderly activists who've been trying or have been doing stuff for a long time. So for us, the bigger issue is getting the, the younger people involved. Um, I just wanted to um, add something to the question around um, policy change. Um, I've been involved with transition for quite a long time, really since it began, and um, most recently have been coordinating the campaign to stop Tesco opening in Stokes Croft, which, <laughs> which I think is a really good example, actually, of where you know transition inadvertently is having a massive effect on policy change. I mean, the reality is that. For, for sort of the first instance, the whole campaign was really positively influenced by the transition movement in that it allowed us to break free of this kind of real anti kind of kind of state of only thinking about what we don't want. And it, you know, there was such an impetus from the start about, hang on, but what is it that we do want? And I think that's really important to remember that you know, campaigning is taking a different face and that it really is beginning to look at the solutions. But also, I think, I mean, I, I, my sort of um, professional background is in campaigning and policy change. And, came from a background of kind of NGOs and, and national international change. And what I really sort of experienced coming from the local level and trying to affect that change at the local level around policy is that people really own that and they really, they understand it. Whereas when you're trying to affect change at that national level, I mean, if we, if we persuade the government to make all these big changes, it doesn't really matter if those changes are put in place if we don't actually change the hearts and minds of the people that, that have actually got to make the change that the policy you know, sort of actually imposes on. So for me, what I really saw happening at that local level was a lot of people being really seriously influenced very deeply and then really you know, sort of owning that policy change, which is a lot more powerful. It's the, the cultural change that Rob's talking about. So I think that the policy change and the cultural change have to go hand in hand. You can't have one or the other. And that transition is inspiring people to really, at the local level, do that, which actually is way more powerful, I think, than only happening at that national level when, you know, we can all 
flick a switch on, a, on our computer and say, yes, we don't, you know, we, or no, we don't want this to happen. But government is, you know, they know that it's fickle. They know that actually just, people, you know, thousands and thousands of people agreeing to one thing, it doesn't mean that people are actually going to do the hard work of bringing about that cultural change. So, yeah, I just wanted to chip in that I think transition is massively affecting policy change. Yeah. Thank you. There's a lady here. I'll apologise now. Um, this is a question that somebody in my transition town asked me this morning. Um, <laughs> I hope the transition towns movement um, have eventually realised that security is paramount to its success and that, and that looting has demonstrated those with no food will take from those who have food. Um, obviously, as food is even more important than Nike trainers. Um, and unless they have a security plan, the movement is doomed. <laughs> Ready? Um, I don't know. Is that the lesson of the? I don't. I don't. It's not a lesson I would take from the riots. That actually everyone runs I out. I just didn't know how to respond as to what the transition movement would, what its response would be to that. I think it's it's something where actually, if 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 it were the case that there was only two or three transition projects in the country uh, and actually what we were doing was creating sort of uh, lifeboat places that had everything in place and not sharing that around and trying to get that happening everywhere then that then that, that would be a danger but I think what, what we're trying to do is to get that out to absolutely everywhere you know so you've got transition happening in islands and villages and cities in hamlets in all kinds of places market towns whatever universities and that's the power of the idea, I think. It's sort of in, in the fact that you can stick transition on the front of things. You know, actually, you have a transition street, you have a transition school, you have a, you know, it can actually be very simple to, to, to apply those ideas in any kind of setting, really. Um, you know, it's always a thing that's been thrown at transition from the beginning, you know, in terms of, well, when the shit hits the fan, actually, everybody just becomes totally selfish. And everybody will just run out and rob from everybody else, and no one's going to hope to so why even bother? You know, maybe they're right. I don't know. I'm, you know, but actually, my sense is that, you know, certainly those stories that we started to see in Japan and in New Zealand and in Spain, and you know, that actually, in places where things have got really, really tough, yeah, you hear stories about things being really dire, but then you also you hear the most amazing stuff that starts to bubble up from that. Uh, and you know, it took a few hundred people to go out and riot. It took thousands and thousands of people to come out afterwards and clean up and do all the stuff that was about the response about what we do. There was in London, these people produced this fantastic de-loot map, which was a map of, of all the shops that had been looted, and saying actively go out and support these shops, go out and support these traders because they really matter. And uh, um, you know, maybe maybe what happens is that happens and, and that and that is the response. But I I I think we're I think we can do better than that, really. Another thought on this is that the idea of self-sufficiency uh, in the U.S. of years ago was one of uh, sort of independence and leaving society. The, the, the idea of self-sufficiency in the U.S. a few years ago was the idea of leaving society and going off into the hills. And I think one of the most uh, important ways is that we have of protecting ourselves a society and, and addressing this point is the aspect of community. And I think this is one of the most appealing things about uh, transition, the transition town movement is that it's not simply the idea of self-sufficiency on an individual basis, which I think is a, a bad way that things were going years ago, but the idea that we come together as communities and help each other. And I think that will be a way of protecting ourselves as communities. And when we feel that we're part of communities, we'll be less likely to want to take things unfairly from members of the community. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I took actually f more from the riots was, was uh, <coughs> that actually it was, I mean, actually when, when you, re when you re read the papers about it, everybody basically used the riots to justify what their worldview was beforehand. <laughs> Uh, so if you thought liberals were rubbish, you said, "Well, there you are. You see, what did you expect?" And if you, but 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 I do think it was very much the kind of the, the dark side of consumer culture. I mean, if you don't have anything and you're constantly surrounded by images telling you that actually you should have those things, I wanted to bring along a, a magazine today that one of my kids had. It had an advert on the back. I love collecting those stories that are just 
kind of consumer culture just totally losing the run of itself. And uh, there was on the back, there was a, a game for a Nintendo, handheld Nintendo thing, that was called uh, Bass Fishing. Ultimate Bass Fishing in 3D. <laughs> so you go fishing <laughs> on a little thing. You sit there for hours and hours. You sit there for hours and hours. Maybe like sitting, eating virtual sandwiches. <laughs> and with a little omelette telling you how damp you're getting. Yeah. And every now and then you catch a fish. Fantastic. And then with the worst one of it I saw the other day, this has nothing to do with anything, but anyway. I was in London and they have these adverts on buses in London with a picture of a, of a woman getting a massage on a beach from behind, hands on her back, nice oil having a massage. And the heading, the, the, the cap, and I couldn't believe this. I took a photo of it, I, I couldn't believe it. It said, uh, and they say that in Tunisia, people get heavy-handed treatment. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine putting that on the side of a bus? Anyway, as I said, that's a complete aside. Yes. Hi, Rob. I'm David Parks. I'm um, promoting a project for building a sustainable community in South Bristol here. Um, I'd like to talk to you about that later, but uh, picking up on uh, a couple of points, one this young lady made about um, uh, changing attitudes or raising awareness. I think we've been talking a lot about that, and I think um, kind of you know bringing people on board has been an ambition, but it's a difficult one uh, without us actually doing something. And I think only I mean that's how I see transition really is because um, I've been to lots of talk shops and conferences and. Uh, you know, good people talking about good aspirations, but not actually doing things. So this, this is, if it's anything, surely about grassroots. What can we do? Doesn't matter if it's a small thing, big thing, whatever it is, uh, and then and then sharing that. And when people can see the benefit of that experience, because I mean, take Stroud, um, co-housing community. If you go there, you know these guys are really proud. They're really got a sense of achievement, sense of happiness, sense of community. And uh, you know, people seeing that and experiencing that will want it. So that surely is the best way we can move forward. The difficulty we have is that uh, we have the rhetoric about good, um, you know, this big society and localism and empowering people and so on and so forth. But on that, uh, there's not a lot of support mechanism in place. So we have to um, mobilise what we have to enable the foot soldiers of the HCA and local government to actually make sites available um, and to trust that the communities that they're engaging with uh, will be able to find good solutions rather than engaging in cons consultation uh, which tends to be in conflict and, and coming back to the negative. So, uh, But it is about really taking what you have in your situation, making something of it project-wise, whether it's just doing an allotment project or whatever it is, and then, uh, and then see. You know, bringing people into that experience. That's my view. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a distinct difference between localism, as is currently promoted by the government, and localization, which is a, which is a very different idea. So localism is very much about shifting the, 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 the political, where, where political decisions supposedly take place. And localization is, a, is, a, is a more, much more of an economic process about bringing those things closer to home. Uh, I think the idea that we can just expect that all communities are somehow on a level playing field with developers or other organisations who would be looking to do that kind of development is, is, is really ridiculous. Uh, and I think that, that as communities and as, as individuals and people coming together, we need to step our game up considerably. And I did an interview with Michael Schumann recently, who'd, uh, who's a sort of a good exponent of, of uh, localisation in the US, one of the leading people there. He, I said, you know, what one thing can transition groups do in order to really make localization happen. He said, go to business school. You know, we need to learn to be able to, ha actually, if we're serious about this, we need to learn to be able to, ha to make these things work in that kind of a way. But at the same time, we need things that are going to come down and, and be hands up. So things like the National Energy Foundation, who give grants to groups who want to set up their own community energy companies, like the social investment business, which for communities who want to acquire their own assets, then there's grants that can enable them to get to that stage of being ready to acquire an asset. It, you know, it needs to come both ways, I think. But I, if we can get that right, then there's enormous untapped potential there in the kind of projects you're talking about. <laughs>